My dear teachers and students, if you and I are here today, if there is a Patna Women's College and Kamal schools in Bihar and all over India, if the Apostolic Kamal congregation has spread to 12 countries, molding and transforming the lives of thousands of students, especially girls, equipping and empowering them to stand on their own and face the challenges of life. It's all due to the vision of one woman, and she is none other than our beloved foundress, Venerable Mother Veronica, whose birth bicentenary we inaugurate on 1st October 2022. Mother Veronica, Ni Sophie leaves, had everything that life could offer. A good family background, sound religious principles, material comfort, a superior education, natural gifts and talents, the promise of a bright and happy future. She sacrificed much more of much of this to respond to her call to give a better future to women and girls especially the less fortunate ones whom she loved and cared for. Even when life was at its dawn, Sophie Leaves had intimations that pleasure, comfort, success, security would not always sustain her. Her view of life naturally was wide, practical, courageous and intensely spiritual. Born at Constantinople of English parents on 1st October 1823, Mother Veronica Nisofi Leaves was brought up in a deeply religious, pious and cultured family. Her father Henry Daniel Leaves, an Oxford scholar with a doctorate in divinity and an Anglican minister, served as a chaplain to the English Embassy in Greece. Her mother, Marina Halton, was the daughter of a colonel in the English Army. The eldest in the family was her brother Henry. Sophie was the second child, followed by three sisters, Marianne, Emily and Catherine. Mrs. Leaves was keen that her children received a good education. They were taught at home by good tutors. Sophie learned classical languages of Greek and Latin and was conversant with the major European languages, French, German and Italian, besides her mother tongue English and later on Malayalam when she came to India. She was taught instrumental and vocal music, dancing, drawing, needle craft, horse riding, and other crafts. Thus, she was a highly accomplished woman. Education was combined with travel and exposure to different countries. She relates that she had voyaged in the Mediterranean 25 times. This provided her with global vision and a universal outlook in her mission. Social concern was instilled in the children by Mrs. Leaves, who was very charitable to the poor. Each of them had to adopt a poor girl for whom they sewed clothes from the money they had saved by sacrificing sugar in their tea and by not spending their pocket money on anything else. All these experiences made Sophie realize the importance of an all-round education in developing and empowering persons. The death of their father, Henry Daniel, leaves in May 1845 while on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land snapped the strongest bond that had held this happy family together. They returned to England. 
Sophie and her sister Marianne were now increasingly drawn to a deeper study of Christianity. Meanwhile, she met a dashing young naval officer who proposed to Sophie and with the mother's consent they were engaged to be married even though the marriage was to take place only after two years. Says Sophie, he was very good and she loved him very much. In the meantime, something was happening within Sophie. She was drawn more and more close to God who was seeking her undivided heart. Faced with a choice, however, with the will of iron, she decided to break off the engagement to the man she loved in order to dedicate her life totally to God. With great respect to the inner promptings of her soul, the naval officer, though sad, freed her from their engagement. In the autumn of 1847, Emily's health began to decline and Mrs. Leaves was compelled to shift the family to Malta, where she passed away. While in Malta, Sophie began to visit the Catholic Church at Valletta, where the real presence in the Eucharist attracted her to the Catholic Church. After due preparation, on 2nd February 1850, along with her sister Mary Ann, she embraced the Catholic faith. When Sophie disclosed the news to her mother, Mrs. Leaves was wept aloud and thrust them away from her. The joy of the day was overshadowed by Mama's tears and Henry's anger. Sophie was now eager to follow her dream of becoming a nun somehow. Divine Providence opened a new road for her. Henry had gone to their estate at Castanotissa where he fell ill and Mrs. Leaves had to go to nurse him. Mama could not think of leaving the two girls alone. So they were sent to the boarding house of the sisters of St. Joseph of the Apparition at Cyrus. The attraction Sophie and Marianne had felt towards the religious life now deepened in the atmosphere of the convent and both of them were received as postulants in the convent of Cyrus in March 1851. Marianne, however, discontinued after a few months, but Sophie received her religious habit on the 14th of September and on the second Sunday of October 1852, she made her profession as a sister of St. Joseph of the Apparition. Her joy and gratitude knew no measure. Sister Veronica's first assignment was the supervision of the border study at the convent in Cyrus. So well did she manage the study hours of these children that she was soon appointed headmistress of the free school run by the sisters. She loved the poor children and working with them, the little seed of the apostolic a postulate of education began to stir within her. In 1856, Sister Veronica was sent to a new foundation at Athens to take charge of the school there. Even though the religious had not yet taken up the care of the sick in Greece, when the king's chief doctor was ill and needed special nursing care, Sister Veronica was chosen to look after him and all the sick members of the diplomatic corps. She says, that was the beginning of my special vocation, love for the sick whom I would tend day and night. 
Besides caring for the sick, she found great joy in administering spiritual solace to her patients before their death. Transferred to Tremorel, a village in Brittany in 1861, as the headmistress of the parish primary school, Mother Veronica poured her love on the simple, pious Britons who were attached to her. When there was an epidemic and many were dying for lack of medical care, along with the sisters she visited the sick, prepared and administered medicines and healed many. Her skills at horse riding enabled her to reach out to distant villages to alleviate the sufferings of the sick poor. Her next assignment took her completely by surprise. She was asked to found a house of the congregation at Calicut, India, on the Malabar coast. She submitted gladly to this urgent call where the poor and the illiterate were awaiting her. Sister Mary Joseph was her companion for the new foundation in India. After weeks of sailing, they disembarked at Point the Gaul in Ceylon. Getting into another ship, which was bound for Bombay, they landed at Mont Dili, a port near Canano. Getting out of the boat, Sister Veronica knelt and kissed the soil of the land which she had come to serve and which was evangelized by St. Francis Xavier and St. Thomas. On reaching Calicut, Mother Veronica was happy and contented to work for the people. Children flocked to the new school. Together with the physical difficulties of poverty, the enervating warm and humid climate, and the limited accommodation, Mother Veronica touched the hearts of all who approached her. She was fond of children, and God's blessings rested on her labors. In all my life, I had not tasted such consolations as at Calicut, she says. However, during her long walks along the beach, she was pained to see the plight of girls who were whiling away their time playing in the sand. Says Mother Veronica, when I see these poor children, especially girls without any means of education, my heart is filled with tenderness and compassion for them. She was gripped with the vision to give them a better future through education. For this, she was ready to leave the congregation of St. Joseph, which she loved, in order to begin a Carmel for the missions, to strengthen the faith of the people and to empower girls through education and sound values. The Carmelite priests, including Father Mari Ephraim too, wanted such a congregation for the education and faith formation of girls. When Mother Veronica made known to her superiors about her call to Carmel and sought their permission to leave the congregation of St. Joseph, she was transferred to Rangoon, Burma, as her superiors did not want to lose her. She obeyed and reached Rangoon in August 1864. Here she ministered to the sick and did much good to the poor around her. However, one day while coming down the stairs to attend to a sick call, she slipped and fell, breaking her ankle. The surgeons in Rangoon were unable to set the broken bone, so she was invited to England by her mother, who got her treated by the best of doctors. The ankle was healed 
and Mother Veronica was called by her superior general to their mother house in Rome. Once again, Mother Veronica put before her superiors her request for permission to leave the congregation of St. Joseph in order to found a Carmel for the missions. Her vocation was tested in Rome and finally she was permitted to enter the cloistered Carmel convent at Pau, France to imbibe the spirit of Carmel from Mother Elias the Prioress. The Apostolic Carmel Congregation was founded by Mother Veronica on 16 July 1868 at Bayonne, France. She received young aspirants desirous of serving and educating girls, especially the poor and the neglected ones in India and elsewhere, and prepared them for the mission. In August 1870, she sent the first batch of three sisters, namely Mother Marie de Zange, Sister Elias and Sister Mary Joseph to Mangalore, India, where they were received with great joy by Bishop Marie Ephraim and the people of Mangalore on 19th November 1870 and were taken in procession to St. Anne's Convent, their future home. Two more sisters, Sister Agnes and Sister Cecile joined them in March 1871. Mother Agnes was appointed superior of the convent, Sister Marie de Zanch, the directress of novices, and Sister Elias, the headmistress of St. Anne's School, which began to flourish under her leadership. Demand for more schools could not be fulfilled at once, but slowly the sisters reached out to those in need first in Mangalore and its suburbs, and then in Kanano, Calicut, and elsewhere in India. In 1922, the sisters reached Sri Lanka. In 1940, on the request of Bishop Sullivan, they came to Patna. The tiny sapling planted on 19 November 1870 has today grown into a mighty tree, spreading its branches far and wide to 12 countries, 1,363 sisters living in 214 convents are managing educational institutions at all stages, from play school to the postgraduate level, reaching out to the rich as well as the poorest of the poor alike. To uplift the poor and the marginalized, especially women and girl children, and enable them to earn their livelihood. Technical schools, job-oriented courses, community colleges, and a host of social uplift programs are planned and executed. Much has been done during the past 152 years and much more needs to be done in the years ahead to give dignity and bring peace and joy, hope and fulfillment in the lives of millions of girls. The vision of Mother Veronica needs to be carried forward with greater generosity, zeal and commitment to empower the future generations. She inspires us to leave our comfort zones, go to the peripheries, enter into the lives of the poor and the marginalized, and work wholeheartedly for their uplift and progress in life. Until and unless poverty, illiteracy and inequality are eradicated, we cannot expect to build a just society in our country. May our Foundress, Venerable Mother Veronica intercede for us.